Um, so I invite you each to come up in turn because we haven't got space for you all to sit here. So our first speaker is Alice. So while Alice comes up and, and gets her presentation set up, I'll just introduce her paper. And also to say that each of the three speakers will have 20 minutes and I will be timing it um, quite um, sharply. Okay, so we've got Alice and she is going to speak about, uh, here it is, qualitative network map interviews combining egocentric network maps and narration. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, my program for today, for the next 15 to 20 minutes, is as follows. I would first like to give an insight into a method of analysis, which I have adopted in my research, and describe the potential for qualitative method analysis. Um, I, particularly, I find the method particularly intriguing, and I, I totally agree with Nick, um, who says we should not just use hammers or screwdrivers, but perhaps even use screwdrivers as hammers or a saws, and see what happens then. And uh, so I'm very glad to, to discuss what, what happened with my um, method while I'm using it. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to the exchange after my presentation, but please feel free to, to ask any questions or, or make any comments along the way if you don't understand. Um, well, um, yeah, so I would also like to record the, the feedback and question and answer sessions afterwards if it's okay with everybody. So I have it immediately and can draw from, from that. Um, so first, to the method which I am using, and then I will get to the way of how I use it, and um, thirdly, I will discuss its potential from my experience and from my point of view. Um, so this method combines the qualitative analysis of egocentric network maps and the analysis of the corresponding narration in three different separated steps. Um, I have not found much literature about this kind of uh, data analysis, and in particular we are lacking descriptions about um, how they can be combined. So currently network maps or qualitative network map analysis uh, uses the maps to generate a discussion, um, whereas myself and my, my colleagues in Hildesheim were trying to use the map when looking at the analysis for, for a broader analysis. So my approach considers the map to be just as relevant a data set as a narration. And, um, and we're looking at different ways in which we can analyze these, these maps, doing the qualitative analysis. Um, the idea behind all this is that structure is usually placed in the context of formal network analysis. Nevertheless, we would like to strengthen the approach which looks at structure using qualitative methods too especially at how structure and meaning can be discussed together. And to exemplify my attempt at doing this, from this presentation, I will use data from one of my interviews with an international student um, as an example of how I employ the method and what the results can be. So just so you know what the data is about, um, although it is not the main focus of today's presentation, the interview topic are important authors in an international student's everyday life. Okay, so it's about international students. I will now quickly explain what kind of network maps I mean um, before I proceed to describe the method of analysis. So I use a pen and paper method. Some of you may recognize these. Um, the network maps I provide the interviewees with are large sheets of paper with concentric circles on them, as, as you may know from, from Kano Montemuchi, for example. Um, the central circle being ego, and the data in the map and the narration is gathered simultaneously, which is also important for the method. Because while we talk, the interviewees know the names of the important authors on a of paper, and then to place them anywhere on the map can stick them, <coughs> can unstick them, and um, depending on how important they are in their everyday life, they can place them in the circles. And all the while, they explain the relationship to the authors and the relationship among the authors, describing their contents and meanings. And this is what map can look like at the end of the interview. Or perhaps also this. This is a more creative one. And turning to my main concern today, the analysis of the maps and the narration. So I have the data from the network map and from the narration collected simultaneously. And the first step consists in writing up an interpretation of the map, independently of the narration, 
And doing this step, I describe the actors on the map, the names or the roles used by the interviewees, as well as places, objects, ideas, or activities mentioned. Um, I also look at the author's positions, any groupings or triads, distant or isolated authors, and describe the ego author and the author author relation. This analysis results in a collection of assumptions and questions about the author's roles, about what the ties and groupings or other formations mean to ego and what they do to the network in general. The second step then consists in analyzing the narration. This is done by selecting specific passages, for example, the beginning, the end, or any passages which I presume may contain important information or discuss relevant topics from my research question, for example. I then analyze these passages in detail, and again, the results of this analysis are assumptions and questions about what the relationship described means to ego, and about the roles the relationship plays in the network. And then in a third step, I combine the results from the two analyses, focusing on how they do and do not converge, so whether they provide converging, diverging, or complementary information. I do not to combine the two data sets before this step because it is important to me to view each kind of data um, on its own and using specific methods respectively because they are quite different kinds of data. Um, of course, the idea behind this qualitative analysis is to gain an insight into the subjective meanings and the importance of the ties or the relationships to the interview partners. And to show how this method for qualitative network analysis can lead to uncovering such subjective meanings, I will now apply these three steps I've shown you um, from to, to data from an interview with an international student about her approach. So this is step one, qualitative analysis of the network map. We have um, an anonymized, anonymized network map from an international student, or other international student. And as you can see in the first circle, we have uh, quite a few authors, but also uh, places, countries, and activities. Um, in the second circle, there are more authors' names, and, and then while describing the relationships, the, the ego also marked in some of the author-author relations with lines and different kinds of arrows. And the analysis, so this, this is a, a jump, it's like jumping out of the analysis and the results of the analysis to the assumptions from this analysis, of, of which I've selected just three for today. The first assumption is that the countries in the network the countries in the network um, are, are somehow important because they're connected to um, uh, alter, to, to ego and to alters, some alters. Um, so they, an idea, an assumption is that they may provide identification, for example. And these are the important country connections. But the second assumption is that the alters being connected to ego and to concepts such as country or family, for example, creates triads which increase their importance to ego. So these connections become more stable, whereas other connections which are less stable and more interchangeable um, are, are less explicitly embedded in the network, for example, because they're not so strongly connected. And the third assumption is and the third assumption is that the visible compartmentalization, you saw the various different colors and various different segments, um, they may have a strong influence on the network, or I suppose they have a strong influence on the network. So these are the three assumptions from the map analysis for which I would like to present today. And now we come to the second step of analysis, which is the qualitative analysis of the narration. This step takes us into the narration first and then leads to assumptions too. And for today I have selected again a few exemplary sections from the narration, which I will read out to you. They're also in your handout, but they're a bit longer in your handout, so these are the more the shorter <laughs> version. Um, <coughs> the first section is, this is not the final destination, it's just a transit. Nobody's connecting with the place, or nobody is letting themselves connect with the place. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe I'm, I'm not letting myself feel like home here, knowing that at some point I will have to leave. It's not just the, the culture that is foreign, it's me that I'm being foreign in this culture. So somehow I think it's a self-imposed exile. The second section 
is maybe that's why people don't want to invest a lot emotionally because then they get attached to someone and then they go away and you don't know if you'll ever see them again. And the third says, I'll put her here because he's also important, also because she might, reminds me of home. She was my brother's ex-girlfriend, so somehow, probably, she's a mental connection to home, family. Um, when we go and buy that stupid thing from the Polish store that has Bulgarian labels, we share them and enjoy it. And these are from the same interview for which the map was taken. So what happens then, I look at some of the sections, many sections from the interview, um, analyze them qualitatively, and from there, draw some assumptions. Um, and, and the whole analysis, I have um, condensed it, uh, and which for today I'll just uh, provide you with a summary. Um, so the international students' international life, as she herself calls it, mar involves a marked mobility, um, insecurity as to where she and also where authors will live in the future, and therefore a constant instability in her connections and highly differentiated personal communities. Her current place of residence is further denoted by fluctuation and detachment, both on her own part and on others, making it difficult for her to feel at home. A few connections have proven to be closer, so more important. Those who are connected to her home country, either because the people are still living there, or because they come from there and are also currently abroad, just like Ego is. At the moment, it is impossible for her to dis establish other deeper relationships. Also, because she feels it is, although she uh, she feels she is trying hard to do so, or investing a, a lot, as she has put it. And um, the difficulty can also be visualized in her own words. She says she's living in a bubble. And now we get to the third step, which involves combining the two parts of the um, analysis, the two analyses of quality analysis, um, to provide a, a broader picture. Again, I've chosen just a few assumptions and brought them together, combine them. Um, so the first one involves the segmentation, which we saw in the map already. It can also be found in the relation. Um, ego has friends and contacts in various places, in various countries, in various contexts. She positions them according to what she has in common with them with their background, for example, their interests, or their origin. Nevertheless, only very few of her contacts share anything amongst them, which leads them to, to not being um, connected among, them, among themselves. Therefore, there are very few auto-auto connections um, surrounding or including ego, as you saw in the map, clearly. The few connections which can be made are assumptions based on common colors and on arrows drawn on the map. And according to this idea, countries or activities then connect people to one another. In fact, they do, so, but the ties actually only exist in relationships to the student as the ego, as I just said. And without her, the relationships do not continue. So she says, without me, I could have a party where everybody could come, but then they do not meet without me. Um, which shows how fractionated this network actually is. And now that we get to, to the second combined assumption, which involves countries and places, because okay, um, so various relevant waters, both in the map and in the narration, are geographical ones. In the interview name, he names five countries, eleven cities, various, various nationalities, a few regions, and a continent, which shows that plays plays an important role in a current life. And as already mentioned, the connection to a country increases people's importance, which can be seen in the map. So those who are connected to her home country are closer to her, or else those important to her are connected to one of the two main countries. In general, places are relevant to others, authors in, uh, other authors in Ego's current network because they influence their occurrence, they vary their frequency of contact, or even prevent other authors from being of importance because they simply are not there, because they're distant, for example. So coming to an end, as I hope I have shown, fo focusing both on, on the maps and on the narrations independently, looking at them separately, but provides the opportunity to approach the interviewee's subject construct, construct in two ways, which can lead to similar or to different results, which one then has to somehow combine. 
With both paths, nevertheless, can uncover structures and meanings relevant to the interview without allocating structure only to the map or meaning only to the relation. So they both provide the relevant database assumptions separately. And it is important to me to stress here that this method of qualitative analysis of the map does not involve a quantification. Quantification is great, and quantitative methods are fantastic. But this is not my approach here, as you've noticed. So the map speaks to itself as a picture of the network structure and of the meanings too, and is then later transformed, translated into a text, not into numbers. And at the same time, this method allows us to look beyond diets by asking how authors are linked to other authors, including things, places, ideas, crises, crises beliefs, festivities, activities, or what they just said, foci, um, and so on. At best, the interviewees take the whole thing to the next, to the meta level themselves, and then they, they themselves discuss how the connections work in the networks and with the networks. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, and then I'm now looking forward to your comments, ideas, any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. I found that fascinating. I've just done some sociograms myself with highly skilled migrants, and so all of those are issues that I am currently working through myself, so I found that very stimulating. I'll take a couple of quick questions for Alice, and then we'll have more detailed discussion at the end of this session. So there's one question here. Are there any other? And one there. OK, so if you just introduce yourself as you ask your question. Hi, Alice. My name is Roger Reed. I'm from Southampton University. I use a very similar technique to do my analysis as well, some of the concentric circles. So I'm interested in just clarifying did you get the participant to actually draw in the timelines? Yes. And how did you prompt them to do that? How? Okay. I'll try to answer <coughs> them quickly and, and to allow them up to the camera. Oh, I'm sorry, I need my phone. Could you just wait and I'll get the other question and then direct you so you can be thinking of your response. Okay, lots of exercise today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Paola Tuber from the University of Greenwich. Um, I also used a uh, somewhat similar um, tool for collecting data. It's something that intrigues me in your um, um, uh, account of the analysis, especially, is what you write just there about segmentation. So the fact that you don't find many relationships between these authors. So I wonder whether. Um, it wouldn't be worth exploring further the connections that may not take the form of ties, strictly speaking, but they derive from belonging to common contexts of interaction. So some of them are like shared interests or shared characteristics, but is there anything more than that, something that they do together, even though they are maybe not close friends or something like that? OK, and one more quick question from Phoebe. I'm Phoebe Moore, I'm based here at Middlesex University and um, I'm part of the Social Policy Research Centre. Um, just a very, very quick question. Did you get a chance to look at any kind of class connection? Since you're working on that class and, and sort of did, did this kind of adjust according to sort of being just that kind of expat dimension, bring together some potentially classes that wouldn't have necessarily been in association? Just a kind of political question. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, so how do participants draw the ties? I asked them, so the first step is to ask them who is important to you. Um, the second question is why and why did you put them here when I asked them to place them on the map? And, and the third one, one of the questions is um, what do they how do they link? How, what do they have in common? Or what do they? Why are they uh, connected? So I no, actually, sorry. I ask, how are they somehow connected? Do they have anything in common? Do they do anything together? Because people usually start talking about connections automatically in my interviews. They say, oh yeah, they know each other because they have university too. So I say, is there anybody else who knows each other, and why? So that provides me with a connection. Um, and I say. Please feel free to draw them onto the map. 
and they did not. <laughs> and sometimes they need different colors and they just pick up a pen, sit down that line there, and take out pens and, and use different kinds of R's and so on. And we saw there are many, many different kinds of maps. And I tried to focus on each one independently too, so not to compare them too much on that level. I tried later on to, to look at them also in comparison. So the further step of analysis, I, I try and find structures on, on, on a you know, better level of analysis combining the various maps on, on a cross, cross sequence. So back to the segmentation, to Paula's question, um, about belonging and to different contexts context of interaction and to, to shared interests. That comes up too. They, they do sometimes even place um, activities, as I said, on the map as a specific order. So they place uh, these, these groups uh, onto the map. I don't think I have one today. I had Tango, as you saw, and Tango provides a and Tango provides um, an import, I call it important entity because it has a two social function, as you can see here on the bottom. And it's, uh, it was my group of people, that's what she says. And as you can see here, there's another thing, which is photography. It's also a group of, um, of, of young journalists. So people bring in groups and, and social contexts themselves and Consider them, yeah, that's the time. So consider them important in their network. Um, you also get uh, a mix of both. So they're, they're, they're alters and the social context they belong to, and then you get the connection to that too. Um, and in the next step, I will also try and look at that. Um, why, why? How do people? identify with groups and what do they, how do they talk about their belongings. So I'm looking at belong beings and belongings right now. What's the, um, yeah. <laughs> and to your, your question about class, um, I didn't ask about that specifically. Um, it is a very interesting situation in life, seemingly, which has a lot to do with, with status perhaps because it's an in between status, between being a student and between knowing uh, yeah, where they belong, maybe coming back to the belonging. Yeah. And so maybe we can, we can say there's no specific class for them, but they, are they looking for the, the, the class they're in? I'm not sure whether, whether I'm too, too firm in that. Um, Yeah, the new location is very important, as you saw, the places are very important. Um, I would I would just assume it's um, it's still this, this in between us which is important because it's not quite clear where they will end up or something very often. It, it does not have to be a problem. This was a problematic situation in this interview, but it does not have to be. Some some are very happy with it because of this um, flexibility exactly. <coughs> I just take advantage of my uh, position as chair to ask a question because, as I mentioned, we're also using these sociograms. And one of the problems we had, we were using the pen and paper method, and you know, Bernie Hogan has written a paper where he's been very positive about the advantages of the pen and paper method. We were looking at highly skilled migrants, and they were a bit skeptical of the pen and paper method. They thought it looked a bit amateurish. So part of what we had to do, and I don't know if Neil is also going to be speaking about this, so maybe I'll hold my question off and ask Neil as well, but it's just the challenge of getting particularly highly skilled and in terms of class, you know, quite senior professionals to take the pen and paper method seriously and not kind of scoff at it. And in the paper that we're writing at the moment, which is a kind of reflexive account of using the sociograms, um, one of us actually refers to it as kind of Blue Peter, which is a very British, um, as an Irish person myself, I know that's a very British thing, but Blue Peter is kind of a children's television program where they often make things out of paper and washing up liquid bottles and things. And so our sociogram was kind of described as a bit Blue Peterish, a bit homemade and childish. So I'm just wondering how your participants, and perhaps we can ask Neil again when he's given his paper, 
how they reacted to the sociogram and did they think it looked a bit kind of not very serious as a tool, as a technique? Yes, actually, um, I only got very positive reactions, um, positive and very positive reactions. A few took pictures of their network maps at the end. A few said, um, this helped me um, get my own personal life situation um, clearer. Um, and a few, one said I should develop some kind of advice, advice method to, um, you know, to, for students or for international students at the end of their career to find out what their focuses are and, um, and to, to decide what they want to do later on in life because they talk about resources a lot too, so social capital and, and one of them was a psychologist and so she suggested I should do that. And <laughs> so it was really, it was really nice um, to work with that. And they took it quite seriously. They they were asking, can I stick it here? Can I stick it there? So they, and they interacted with the map a lot. So it, the whole interview was um, very, yeah. The method is a very holistic one because they keep on talking themselves, and and the map reminds them of connections they have not talked about yet. And they do focus a lot on the connections. So the whole thing about yeah, talking about connections becomes much easier. It came much easier through this through this method. Okay, well, thank you very much again to uh Hello there, my name is uh, Neil Armitage. Um, today I'm presenting Biographical Networks, Whose Network Is It Anyway? The kind of Whose Network Is It Anyway was just kind of a, a quick idea that I came up with to kind of provoke and make you all think of when you're studying networks, whose network are you actually studying and do they get to say anything about it? Um, I've been dabbling with networks since 2005 and I use the word dabbling because I use quantitative but I use it only to a certain extent because it gets to a certain level that I start to kind of lose interest and the language takes over and I get lost in the language. So what I'd want to do is just basically position the approach that I took during my PhD I will be using examples to kind of illustrate a few of these things, um, but in some sense, this is in kind of, this presentation comes in uh, response to revisers I've had to make to papers, and the problems I've had trying to get papers through that process, and realizing that, reflecting on that, and seeing then where do I fit in to social network analysis and mixed methods. And therefore I just thought, top of my head, social network is a field, we're all here today, we're all from very different disciplines. And it brings people together and it has conference, etc. But it also has quite a formulaic language, which helps us all be able to talk to each other and people can present things from different fields, different areas, and everyone understands. But really to reiterate what kind of Nick said, and me dabbling really with uh, social network analysis, is that primarily I've always seen it as a research tool and that is to answer a specific question and sometimes it's relevant and sometimes it's not so really that's where I'm trying to kind of come from from the beginning just positioning the approach that I developed that really even though I draw the language and I'd like to add to the field, that's why I'm here primarily I see it as a research tool and a method which is, you could argue, pretty obvious So. The question for my PhD was how Mason would evolve the cosmopolitan stance. So I did my research on cultural cosmopolitanism and we define cosmopolitan stance, or others have, as an openness and a willingness to engage with the other. Obviously, networks therefore can be used. And I identified by this, this stance is identified by the transcendence and contestation of essentialized identities, social boundaries. Well, it's all right saying that, but then you have to operationalize it. And how do you actually measure that? And how do you actually get, go around looking at that? So, others have discussed the concept of cosmopolitan conviviality. You could call it cosmopolitan sociability. Um, but I find it, for my own purposes and kind of for exploration, as taken of the personal relationships initiated and maintained through face-to-face -face interaction with others. That are objectively different in terms of nationality, social class, ethnicity, religion, age, and so on and so forth. 
and emphasis on objectively different. So, I started to think, well, in some ways, I've always thought that networks and uh, personal networks or ego networks, in some ways, are a picture of self, is that we see ourselves through others, and therefore, that was really my interest in networks from the start, was how can we look at self? And really, my research question was looking at self from a cosmopolitan lens. So obviously, the ego network method, I could start looking at how people maybe transcend social boundaries on who they meet in their everyday life and who they interact with. And therefore, it provides me with the tools to measure homophily, heterophily, heterogeneity, i.e. the diversity that people interact with in their everyday life, and then also the quality of these relations, these alter, by asking different types of questions through the name generator. And then obviously the network method enables me to look at the connections between alter and social context, or the phobias we've been discussing earlier, back to the language, and then map relations between alter within a cross-social context as is it Alice or Alicia? Alice, as discussed, thank you. And then also, I was thinking that I need to kind of give people, a, I give people an idea of how to contest these identities and contest these boundaries and discuss them openly. And obviously the biographical method and life story to use is an ideal um, method to use, or I thought it would be an ideal method to use. And this also acknowledges the multiple contexts of life experiences. So it maps quite well with the ego network, because ego networks obviously are not bounded, and therefore why should you have the stories around them bounded? And the biographical method allows that to, kind of, to see that the whole life experiences are relevant. Um, and then the subjective meaning of these experiences and how these experiences are told are all kind of important elements of the biographical approach according to Brown and Nielsen in the 2011 paper. And then how do you kind of fuse these things together? And that's what really I'm going to move on to next and show and uh, exemplify in some way. But what I want to do is really to get bring the kind of people who are going to do interviews with to bring them into the process. And in some sense, when we look at networks, they are kind of atemporal. Even though the time, even though they can like a picture of a biographer, you can see the biographical elements in them. They don't generally display, when you visualize them, you don't actually see the time element in them. And I was kind of a bit concerned about that. And with biographical methods, there's been an idea of timelines to kind of show how to kind of structure. So in some, some ways, what I've only done is combine timelines with social network analysis. It's very simple. But just quickly, when I'll be revising for my paper, and I'm thinking, why, what? Because as Alice shows us, or when I was listening to Alice, it just shows you how many different ways you can actually construct and produce network data. And in some ways, I tried piloting um, using something similar to Alice, where they did the network first and they told the story. And that gives you two sets of data. And obviously, you could do the biographical first and the network second, and it gives you, again, two sets of data. But there's going to be different shades. So different shades of purple in this nice diagram I put here for you. Whereas really what I was trying to do is kind of fuse them together and not have a sequential model, but have for better, for better time. I was trying to think of a way to kind of explain this. How can you fuse them to create a hybrid or embed one in the other? So, in biographical networks, I use the network in some sense as a base to guide the biographical, but not to determine it. And then the biographical use that to contextualize the network, uncover the dynamics. And then that allows, that the, in one interview I'll show, allows then for the uh, participants to kind of like explore in connection with the researcher the discrepancies, contradictions, repetitions, so they can reaffirm things. Or can I think, actually, when you think about it, I might not be correct when I'm saying that. So it's like a dual check, it's like a, a validity check, or, and it allows them to kind of explore. And coming back to that last question you know, Alice had of, kind of bringing the person in, that brings the person in, and it makes them own the network. So therefore, I never had any problem regarding 
with a high-tech, low-tech sort of argument. So that's the biographical sociogram. Um, how did it work? I did a survey prior to the interview, and I asked them a name generator, which was based on um, asking them who they know, uh, different nationality, different social class background, so I was told that I had to do that, because I was in England. Um, and um, also then I asked them, given the opportunity of the name generator, to define people they saw as different, so they had a subjective implication into what they thought was different. And then during the interview, I allowed them to add alter, which here is the purple, because obviously through the life story, and through doing the process, people come to mind. And also in the survey, I said, right, if you're going to write your, if you're going to write the biography of your, of your life, what would be the ch uh, chapter titles of the book? And they were allowed to use as many chapter titles as possible. I'd like to thank Elisa for that idea. And um, so they could name as many chapter titles as possible. And what I did first was get them to go through their life story. I didn't even mention the network at all. Just go through the life story. And just initiate the whole interview with... I see the chapter titles as like the skeleton of your life, and I'll put flesh in the bones. And that would take however long it took. Hopefully, around, about an, around an hour mark, I would say. And they went through them generally chronologically. And because I had this information prior to the interview, I could draw the amount of concentric circles that I needed for the interview. So this one here has got about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rings that he gave me each with subjective titles and then we went through the interview and then obviously we took up, I prepared all the labels prior to uh, the interview and then we could do it in place. Just make sure I don't forget it. So I did this with um, uh, 28 people uh, who I kind of classified as movers and non-movers. The movers are similar to the people that Alice and uh, Louise have been talking, but not to kind of say anything against your approaches. I was more interested in how things evolve, and that's why I took the biographical kind of approach. So really I wasn't really interested post-migration, even though I was interested in that, I was interested in the whole life story, which may lead to the example of to kind of explain why they become a migrant why they become a mover, why they don't become a mover, etc, etc, etc. And I did these interviews in Madrid and Manchester with young British and Spanish adults. And by combining the uh, quantitative measures of uh, heterophilia and heterogeneity, and looking along the different dimensions of nationality, social class, different differences, and they're all subjective kind of implications of how they kind of discuss these in the interview prior to and after the network. I could really kind of take an iterative circulatory process of going from qual to qual, qual to qual, and just mixing the two all the time. And I basically that's my final kind of results. Really. And I came to kind of these 28 people, and I placed them into four convivial spheres which I call the national, the metropolitan, the transnational, and the cosmopolitan. And just a quick kind of uh, explanation is that even though it's a typology, it's not a fixed typology, in the sense that people move through these, and the thicker boundary of the national and the cosmopolitan is that they tend to be settled. So if you're in a national, you can have remained a national. But to get to the cosmopolitan, you probably move from the national to the metropolitan, to the transnational, to the cosmopolitan. So it's kind of an evolutionary kind of typology, which maps people's kind of life courses and the networks, etc. But this, oops, but this produces quite distinctive um, graphs, and obviously, any network visualization you have to kind of balance what you can say and what you can't say without a lot of, kind of complication. And the ideal thing with the uh, networks and the actual measurements, and usually quantitative, is that then you can start to compare cases. But also we have to kind of create a structure to compare them. So I have to kind of like think of uh, their life, biographies, uh, something about childhood, 
adolescence, studies and work life one, work life two, so that even though they have the subjective uh, pos uh, possibility to explain their life story and in coordination with the network, the comparison I had to start kind of looking into these five life phases. Now in this network, ego is not in there, and the rings basically represent time going out, like the biographical social realm of chapters. And in some of these five, you'll get two chapters, three chapters, so I have to assign the chapters into the certain life phase. Um, in this case, all the blue are co-nationals, i.e. people of the same nationality, and red are other nationals, and the yellows are other debts or other differences which they've identified. And Anna had lived in Madrid for nine years and worked having lived, left her town in the north of Spain. And it was interesting to see that all her friends her homes, were still based in her home city. And she had very few, well she had friends, but she called these really her true friends, her real friends. Uh, and this was all established during high school and you love new friends and a lovely time in my life university. And she regularly goes home. And in some sense she never really kind of felt an affinity with Madrid where she was living, and, but she had a few key people in Madrid that she kind of relied on for you know, social support, etc. Um, but you also kind of like, because you've got the distribution of uh, Alter in the network over time, you can start to kind of like develop the language, or develop a new language, or a qualitative language. And here I was thinking this is like an example of a bottom heavy network. And she tends to have a more nostalgic and fixed convivial outlook. And therefore, I classify her as a national. That's uh, an example of a metropolitan one. Obviously, I can't really kind of, there's so much detail involved in this map with the narratives, and I can't really kind of give a full account, but I used a similar. Uh, I use the Hogan uh, method, but of course, the, instead of changing the rings for closeness, I use the rings for uh, time. And but Miguel was quite interesting because he wanted to project himself as a cosmopolitan, as someone who lost lots of friends from all here and everywhere. But he actually, through his network and through his discussion, you can see that he was a strategic, he was a very strategic network person, and he kept his uh, native friends and his you know, foreign friends that he met through language interchange in Madrid on a deliberate purpose, so that he could project in some ways himself as a cosmopolitan. But he did have an even distribution of uh, people across his network, and he felt, and as a result that was kind of, he didn't really have this kind of like uh, pulling backwards and forwards, it was quite, geographically it was quite stable. Uh, this is a gentleman I interviewed, an English guy, who after the meeting, somewhere around here, he met his Spanish wife, Raquel. And um, as a result, his network became divided between the two countries. But when talking, he says, the main thing is that from my point of view is that it feels like a different life here, but the people that I remember most clearly were from when I was growing up. And therefore, his kind of ideas of the present and his ideas that I was trying to get of this kind of sociability are based not only on what happened since his move to Spain, but prior to that, and how they're interconnected. And that's really what I wanted to show, is that kind of how subjective meaning is not only based on the present, but it's also based on what's going on in the history of the network. And then finally, um, Nacho, whose title for his autobiography was Maybe Tomorrow I'll Find My Way Home, was a very kind of un-Spanish Spanish person in the sense that um, in his um, childhood, which is titled Nobody Said It Was Easy, his, divorce, his parents divorced and he was always constantly kind of flitting between his, his mother and his father's house and having to deal with the kind of aftermath of that with grandparents. And this is what I kind of coined in his biography as like socialized diplomacy. And um, as a result of always kind of like having to manage this situation. And then his mother remarried to a bank director in, uh, where was it now, Alicante, who had to move every two years for his work. 
She was constantly the new kid in school. And as a result, he never really kind of like engaged or kind of like put so much energy to make new friends at school because he knew that after two years he'd be moving. And but interestingly, his, his true friends that he called in this box here were people that he kind of met when he was around 15, 16, when he had first got his independence as an adolescent. He was allowed to go out and have drinks, hang on the street corners, have burgers, that sort of thing. But then he kind of like through few movements, he moved from Alicante and got to Madrid, but he's always had this kind of like need for newness, because it's like within his kind of biography, always newness, newness, newness. And he moved into a house, and through the house and through different contacts, he developed quite a wide network. But unlike Miguel before, who kind of separated his network between people who we kind of socialised with his nationals and non-nationals separately, um, Nacho was kind of really kind of an active translator and brought people together and therefore I say he kind of, he kind of facilitates further conviviality for others. But he's not as a broker, he's not thinking of what can I make out of this. He's just doing it out of the sheer joy of it. And sometimes I think network languages sometimes looks at the kind of like material or kind of like um, the instrumental. And it, it was no, there's no instrumentality in this whatsoever, really. Not that I could gather anyway from the interview. And I think it's a lot to do with his own biography and how the biography therefore maps out into his network and the kind of strategies he places or the kind of way he manages or doesn't manage his network. He's just quite open. But it's very an example of a top heavy network with a forward and open outlook. So just to sum up, I didn't give every detail that I could for all the networks. Uh, there's quite a lot of information on there. I appreciate it's kind of sometimes difficult to kind of like get a grasp of networks. But the formal uh, network analysis and the quantitative stuff that I gathered through the kind of survey and then prior to that, I could do analysis prior to the interview, so I could prepare myself. So that also helps you produce the data and then organize and focus the quality of data production and analysis. And it is that circular process between the two. Um, the biographical method really kind of gets you to kind of like develop a language, provides an ideal tool to contextualize network structure and dynamics, and look at the kind of relationship between time and space in people's lives, but also the, the significant others in their lives. Uh, the language, obviously, like I say, enables comparison. But sometimes I think that maybe a pursuit of standardization is in the methods and this is me as a bit uh, person trying to revise an article, uh, is that it kind of, but have you, I understand you have to kind of like relate it to other methods used, and et cetera, and things set in stone, but sometimes if you actually take an approach which is kind of a question generated, it's going to be very difficult to kind of find standard me measures and methods to discuss with that. So maybe it's kind of sometimes a, a blanket fit all method is not, you have to kind of get it from your question. But that will create difficulties when it comes to kind of like selling it. Um, and I think in some ways uh, I would recommend or what I want to kind of talk about is hybrid and embedded approaches instead of like maybe sequential approaches. Because then you start to kind of like fuse these methods and then you develop the language and it'll create language from itself in the bottom up. And instead of moving kind of network most network dynamics from this kind of like longitudinal kind of snapshot kind of um, process um, based on selection and influence. Because when you do this type of work, you realize that you can't really look at selection and influence as two kind of separate processes, but that they're just so interesting. Obviously, for analytical purposes, people do that. Um, but you just don't see the kind of, as soon as you get into the data, you start to realize how restrictive it is and that it doesn't enable. And if there's one thing that mixed method approaches for me, it's kind of like, do you shackle yourself in some of the language sometimes? And you explore your bit more. Thank you very much, Neil. And as somebody who is also in the process of revising an article with a bloody referee who keeps going back to the same bloody thing all the time, I completely empathize with the frustrations of having to please a referee.
Um, okay, so parking that for the moment. I also noticed that you had another song title up there, like Rolling Stone. So who yeah. knew there was going to be such a strong musical theme in today's seminar? Okay, so if I could take some questions, please, for Neil. I'll take a little cluster of questions again, since we're using technical terms. Otherwise, I'll just have to start asking questions. Okay, so Elena and the gentleman at the back. And then if you could just introduce yourself again. I'm Elena Zona, I'm from Bremen University, and um, I was wondering, um, how did you define vegan strong ties, and isn't there something that is changing over the time, the quality of the relationship with the Do you have any idea how you could um, present it on the map? Because as I understood, it's like a snapshot uh, of the uh, time uh, point when you were taking the interviews. Uh, so I was wondering, for example, in the case um, that one, uh, for example, the meeting yeah. circle or the university circle, yeah. uh, if you're using this biographical method and the person is telling you about uh, some um, person that were important at that time, but they're not important in uh, the life of this person anymore, or maybe they're dead, or maybe there was a conflict, uh, would they still be in the map? Um, this is the one question, and the other question is, um, mm, yes, I was wondering, like, for example, for your typology, um, cosmopolitan typology, yeah. for example, uh, if a person has many contacts to um, colleagues who work, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have a good relationship or they like each other. So how is this uh, is, um, uh, characteristic of being cosmopolitan? Uh, do you have any way like to represent a negative relation? Yes. Yeah. No, okay, thank you. I would just ask you to hold on to that for one minute, thanks, Neil. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alistair Jones from the London School of Economics. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. I was just interested in going back to your research question, which I found really interesting. I was intrigued if you could just um, tell us what, if, what were the sort of common features that enabled a kind of cosmopolitan stance and how far did your the network component of your work kind of help you understand that over and above what you could have found out from the biographical stuff so i was very interested in that show for instance you seem to have that and i was wondering what kind of common features of, a, of developing a cosmopolitan stance you found are there any other questions i have to get two mics in this room <laughs> Right, in fact, I think if I think for two seconds, I may be able to answer both questions in one. Um, the strength of ties, I, the name generator was designed so I can elicit, without asking them about difference, the strength of ties, and I have two questions, who do you discuss in personal, important personal matters with? And because there were young people, I tended to ask them who do you enjoy socialising and maybe travelling with? So I kind of had two questions that's pertinent to just the quality of ties. And because they could repeat the number of times thereafter, when I asked them of the nationals, of the social class background, of other people, what I did was then basically kind of coincide, see how many of those others came in the first group. And therefore I could measure what I call the convivial network, and then I measured those, that small network of those intimate times. I also offered an opportunity for them to kind of like name people that had been important in their life prior but were no longer important, or people that they considered important. And I used those kind of like different measures, and different sizes of the networks to measure the measurements of homophilia, heterophilia, heterogeneity across them on various dimensions, and see how they intersect or not. So I looked at what I call horizons, that can, the, the width of their interaction across different cultures, and then I looked at kind of social class and sexuality and all the other kind of dimensions and see how actually deep their networks are. And therefore I was trying to expand the idea of cosmopolitanism as not something just purely kind of simply cultural or kind of like lateral, or some, something more kind of two-dimensional. And then, um, so therefore I got kind of like the ideas of the strength of ties. I didn't really call them weak and strong ties. I kind of developed an idea of kind of ties and bonds. Because bonds stay with you even if you're not physically present with them. 
So you can be in a situation on this idea of you know, co -presence, or co presence and co absence. So in a sense, if you're looking at like you're walking down the street, but your friend is 2,000 miles away, but something on the street reminds you of your friend. They're physically with you. And in some ways, the ego networks are these cognitive networks. So therefore, it's not really kind of a physical interaction, as long as they're there in mind. So that's kind of how that came about. Um, on the traits of um, you know, developing that stance, um, it was kind of that evolution of getting to know people through different foci and making them um, part of, integral part of your network and your bonds. Um, and the network, but a metropolitan and a cosmopolitan network look very similar and have similar characteristics in the sense they're quite low density it's got people spread here, there and everywhere geographically whereas the national and transnational were more dense because they have, have one folk here or, or two folk here spread between two countries um, but it really came out in their articulation through their life story how reflective obviously there's some interpretive element on my part but also interpretive element, I gave them the chance to interpret their own life experiences in relation to the network, in relation to what they'd said before and that was kind of an opportunity for them to contest and discuss difference in a kind of like abstract form um, obviously that might, there's implications with doing it that way but in the network then I saw how they kind of, the distinction that I made here with people who actually can promote conviviality not only laterally but that way as well and bring people together and do it on purpose and what I would say is have faith in people whereas some people would say no I don't let them mix because I don't I know they won't get on whereas the cosmologists were like no I want the social experiment I want to witness the social experiment I'm going to bring these two groups together which I don't think we're going to get on good feeling but let's see what happens and that's what there's other kind of little differences between uh, there's very many mid idiosyncrasies, but I found that people who um, never felt at home during childhood, so I call it a bit, the cosmopolitans were like the party of the misfits, the ones who never really, never conformed and never fitted in, and always felt that they wanted to be away. <coughs> and also this kind of family structure was very important, having to deal with mommy and daddy not being getting on, or kind of having kind of this sort of, yeah, socialized diplomacy as I call it and not a, a settled opinion. But that wasn't determinist, it was played into it though. And uh, that's it. Okay, thank you very much Neil. I, I found your paper really thought provoking because I've been struggling with how to capture that temporal <coughs> dynamism on these maps. And I think your suggestion of doing the concentric circles as a sort of biography has been really, really helpful for me personally as well. So thank you very much for your paper. Um, thanks again to Neil. Hello everyone, and um, a very big thanks for having me here. <laughs> so a little bit about myself before I start with my presentation. My name is Konigere Lisa Costa. I'm currently in the second year of my PhD at the London School of Economics. I'm, in the, I'm doing my PhD in New Media, Innovation and Technology. And my primary interest is in studying social, how social networks and social relations are impacted by the use of online social networking platforms. Um, again, I have to say I'm really, really thrilled to be here because pretty much the first year of my PhD, I was kind of talking to people about social network analysis and they were, what they kept telling me was like, oh no, no, you're not doing social network analysis, you kind of don't belong to us and go away. <laughs> so it's really nice to have like find kind of like an intellectual home here, so thanks very much. Okay, um, so before I start going in depth with what I actually did methodologically, I'm currently in the process of doing interviews with um, seven artists, which are primarily photographers and fine artists. And at the moment I'm, I'm doing the network maps with them, and um, um, I do qualitative interviews with them, but before I tell a little bit more about my methods, I thought I'll give you a bit of context what my project is actually about. So 
what I put up here is a picture of a um, gallery exhibition that I visited as part of my research. This is uh, in um, around the Shoreditch area in London. And I think this was visited by um, the artists, of course, um, art curators, um, art collectors, journalists, art critics, and I had the, uh, the opportunity to speak with many of them. And I think what comes across quite nicely in this picture, and this is also why I put it up here, is that apparently um, building and maintaining social relationships is seems to be an essential part of an artist's career. And um, to go a bit more into depth, and I'm boring heavily here from Pierre Bourdieu, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. <laughs> so, um, so underlying this claim that social relationships are uh, an essential part of uh, an artist's career is the assumption that if we look at the artistic scene as a, as a sort of field of cultural production, then we look at this field as um, kind of where all the individual players come together and they're all kind of striving to be recognized players in this field. So I'm just putting up my players here, photographers, um, fine artists and um, visual artists. And what my uh, assumption is that underlies my whole project is that they all depend on social relations to establish recognition to become legitimate players in the field. So what I'm wondering then is, speaking about online social networking platforms, um, is what significance do social relations fostered in online social space have for artists to become recognized players in this field? So social relations that are maintained via Facebook, via Instagram, for example, or via Twitter, just to name a few of them. So the main research question and what I'm actually looking at is the impact of resources based on digitally mediated social ties for the artistic practice of for the artistic practice of visual artists. And um, I'm looking at I chose to study to look at uh, social capital as the main conceptual frame for my research, which I think makes sense when I'm studying social social relations. So I'm essentially looking at social capital or what social capital that is maintained by social interactions facilitated in online social spaces actually is, how we can portray this form of social capital and if it is in any way different from a traditional conceptualization of social capital. I just put it up here, I mean I'm sure I'm well, at a conference of the British Sociological Association so I think um, you're pretty much all familiar with what social capital is in theory. But I just put it up here because I want I kind of used it for me in the very beginning of my research as a reminder to kind of tease out keywords that would enable me to tackle the issues at stake. So what I thought was that I have in order to get to the resources to kind of un un unveil what the resources might be that are behind um, social relationships that are maintained in an online social space. I need to look at the networks of these people and I need to start looking at the relationships. And so what I was wondering then was what significance do social relations foster in an online social space have for artists to become recognized players in the field as I said before. And when I started to think about this, how I could tackle this methodologically, my first thought ran um, to a traditional form of social network analysis, an ancient narrator technique. And I wanted to give you an example here of what I did as part of my pilot studies that I carried out in the first year of my, um, of my PhD. So this was, um, as I said, based on an ancient narrator technique that I did with a, with a photographer who is based in London. And I asked her, I put up here the, the kind of trigger question that I asked her in the beginning. So I, I asked her to answer or to name the people that she thought were important for her to be able to do her work as an artist successfully, whatever her interpretation of success might be. And since I was interested to kind of a traditional offline social space together with context in an online social space, I thought, okay, how, 
how could I try to do this? And my first try here was to just use sticky tapes with different colors. So what I asked her to do is first of all to name all the people, to write down the names. And I asked her to please write down the names of the people that she knew primarily face to face on the blue sticky tapes, which you can see here that are very central. And the other ones that are primarily maintained via or in an online social space via online social networking platforms on the pink sticky tapes. And then I had kind of like an in-between option. So um, for her, you know, if she wasn't sure if it was primarily online or offline or if it was something in between, I said, okay, these are the yellow sticky tapes. And I must say I found this, this approach quite useful for the offline context, the face-to-face -face context. But I kept thinking that something, when we are talking about context maintained by a digital online social space, I thought, I'm missing part of the picture, and this is not really giving me the answer. And while this was, in the beginning, more of an intuition that I had, um, I later talked with another photographer who kind of gave me confirmation of why there is a problem. And I wanted to read out this quote here from um, a photographer who's also based in London. I spoke with an uh, interstellar here. And she said to me when I asked her to kind of bring down or to put down the, the names of the people that she thinks are important um, of her online and social relations, she said, to be honest with you, I interact with those people, but because they're not close in any way, shape or form, I don't even remember their names. So I have 719 strangers on Facebook, sorry, on Twitter, who are supporting my art, send me some comments, but I'm completely detached from them. I really cannot tell you their names, and it's quite, it may sound quite weird, but they are important only in a way that they are not even faces. So this is what they told me. And, well, after that, I had like, kind of a short crisis. And I thought, okay, if this method doesn't give me the, the answers that I'm actually looking for, so what do I do then? And um, I kind of decided to kind of take a leap of faith and come up with my own method of my try, which is what I call here the hand-drawn network map. I just wanted to give you a picture here of what I'm actually using as some sort of like a toolkit. And this is the network map before I started uh, to draw the network map of uh, this photographer seller. And so what I did, I just arrived at, um, uh, to the interview and I brought uh, like a blank sheet of paper. I brought with me like sticky tapes in all kinds of colors. I brought highlighters, I brought pencils in all kinds of colors to just give them an opportunity um, to draw whatever they wanted. And I didn't want them to be constrained by any template, by any method, by any idea that I brought to the scene of what a social network is, how it might look like, and how we might think of a relation. And the other motivation was to be able to trace relationships from a process perspective, to not fill in the gaps, more to say, but to kind of understand what these gaps actually are. And um, what I think it allowed me to do is to also look at social interactions that are fostered in different social spaces, so offline and online, and how they could stand next to each other. So this is an example of, sorry, um, a network, a free network drawing that I did uh, with another, with a photography student actually at the University of the Arts in London. And this is a snippet of um, the network map that I did. and. Um, you can see here how she's focusing, like the F is here, how she would imagine herself to be connected to the people that she has on her Facebook account. The one at the very top is how she would imagine to be connected to the people on her Twitter account. Then there is Instagram, then there is her website, and then are numerous other ones. And what I think this method enabled me to do is to give meaning to the characteristics of specific relations. So to not just have the relation there, but to actually understand what's behind this relation, how people give meaning to these relations. So the colors, I actually just for them a tool to be able to tell me 
what do you think a relation is? So they were drawing this and I was asking them, ah, you draw this in orange or you draw this as a dotted line or a dashed line. What do you actually mean by that? Also, I've, it allowed me to, or it allowed the participant to express a more intuitive interpretation of what their network would be and what the relations in the network are. And here with this method, rather than speaking about the nodes first and then think about what the relation actually is, the relations here are the centerpiece of describing sociality in digital social space. And what she said about this method, while she was drawing this, we also talked about what she thought about this whole experience. And she said, when she was drawing all these connections on Facebook and Twitter, she, th she said, I think about interactions, but I don't really think of names. Even people I've met, but then I don't think of, I think of the experience that happened with them. I think more of the experience or the learning that's come out of it rather than them as separate people. So I was wondering, um, I had all these data, I've carried out about 10 interviews so far, and I was thinking, how can I make sense on how can we think visually of what's actually happening, happening um, to sociality when we speak about how so, uh, social relations are maintained in an online social space. And I came up with this metaphor, let's see <laughs> how it works, and I was kind of thinking that we could think of this person, be it Stella or Phaedra, as an eagle, as some sort of like a fisherman who is fishing for big fish or smaller fish, it depends, in a vast blue ocean. So what this ego then does is what I call to send out a cue of a social relation or a cue for, we could say, social, uh, social relational investment. And um, what then happens, so this could be, for example, um, a blog post, or it could be a message on Twitter, or a message on Facebook, or whatever it is. And then there are all these potential faceless nodes that uh, one of my photographers has been speaking about. They're all swimming in the ocean, they're faceless, they're all there, until one of them bites the bait and kind of reciprocates the relationship, so then eventually the relation becomes complete and is reciprocated and established, let's say. And what you can do, and how I would imagine this uh, through Facebook and Twitter, is to kind of, you know, enhance this effect and to get even more fish with just one single effort. And I wanted to give you an example of how this worked for, again, Phaedra, the person I was speaking about before, the photography student, and she said, when she spoke about her blog, her blogging activity, she said, I guess it's all interactions with people. Or say the Royal Academy invited me to blog on something. I don't really have a big blog. I don't know how they found my blog, but they did. And they asked me to one of their blogging things, and then obviously that's a positive reaction because I was invited to talk about it. For me to practice and write about, that's good. So this is how I would imagine how the blog post that she posted in the beginning was then reciprocated by a person that she doesn't even know. Yeah. And became a meaningful relation for her that carried a lot of uh, importance for her practice as an, as, an, as an artist. And to conclude, I just wanted to give you some pointers of what I've learned so far, and maybe so, so you can also identify if this could be a useful method for you. Um, first of all, Drawing the hand-drawn, uh, the, these network maps drawn by my hand with the participants, it gave me an opportunity to understand what the strategies are that artists employ using online social networking platforms to establish relations with others. So I got kind of more information how hashtags are meaningful for individuals to establish connections, interactions, whatever it may be with other people how to use geotagging to get in touch with other people and to establish a relationship face-to-face uh, -face eventually, and how to use engaging visual content to kind of uh, make people reciprocate their, the, the cues for their social investment. Also, um, 
like uh, the example before, I think showed quite nicely. It was about artists. I could, I, I got an artist narrative with these faceless others, and the relevance of these relations. Also, I found out about probably a different range of resources that artists perceive as important for their artistic practice that has been extended to include online ties. So for example, social monitoring, seeing what other people are doing to kind of feel part of something that's not really on their agenda like immediately, but that they could follow like by using um, online social networking platforms and being perceived uh, as uh, the perceived feeling of being part of something bigger. Also, I found out, and this was quite surprising to me, that apparently emotional connectedness is less relevant for feeling actually connected. So it was quite a paradox for me to kind of hear how they were talking about all these faceless people who they didn't even know their names of, but they attached very high importance to these people. So it was kind of for me interesting to see how they do not really feel emotionally connected, and yet they seem so important, these, all these alters this seems so important to them. And lastly, um, obviously the network that we have drawn up here is a very subjective snapshot of a person's social embeddedness. And I got the impression that while we were drawing this, and many, many of the artists and photographers they actually told me, look, this what we are drawing today might look entirely different if we do this two weeks from now. And so how I made sense of this was that apparently what seems to be the case and what is often, I think, suggested if you do a traditional name-generated technique is that the network defines the people. But I think it's actually the other way around, that the people, the artists, actually define what their network is by using online social networking platforms. And to conclude, I have here some, some things to think about, which I would be really keen about to hear your ideas because these are the questions that I'm struggling to answer at the moment. So how do we harmonize these findings with traditional forms of network analysis and is this possible? For me, I think both of them are really relevant, but it's really difficult but, um, to kind of get enough detail from kind of different social spaces with one, with one, just one method. How do we think about a person's social networks? network, uh, which social relationships should we consider worthy of analysis and which ones not, how should we know? And are there more suitable ways to make sense of a social network visually? And by this I mean, what are the tools, can we think of better visual tools that we can bring to the field so to enable people to actually speak to us about their relations and about their social network? So yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Cornelia, I, mean, I, I think there's some really interesting work going on there and one of the things that I've been thinking about is, is how, for example, tools structure how people see their networks, that these are not just neutral data collection tools, but how a sociogram actually almost forces people to bring their network into being in a particular format. Um, and I think what you've been doing by just having no template and just going there with a big sheet of paper and letting them draw whatever they like, I do wonder though, because your participants were artists, they obviously rose to the challenge. My participants were bankers, and they, I wonder how they would have really felt about the colored pencils. But, but for you, it's, it's clearly worked, and it's introduced some very innovative data. OK, so if we take another cluster of questions for Cornelia. OK, so we've got three in a row. Great, less, less mobility for me. And remember to introduce yourselves again. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. My name is Elisabeth Tartini, Middlesex University. Um, my, my question emerged from where the presentation went to, let's say, because you, you moved from you know, the classical presentation of networks with a name generator to these faceless, yeah. more remote, let's say, connections. Mm -hmm. And I, I was wondering if that was something that then affected your research focus as well, because I had the sense as you were going on that the actual names that there were, I think, in the blue tags initially, mm -hmm. they were not as important anymore. And it's as if your research is focusing on what these faceless connections mean and how to this then inform who the person is and what their priorities are in terms of the work connections as opposed to the more general connections. 
And I just wanted some clarification on that. Presumably they are in some part the photographer's audience or public, and they would have to be nameless. But, but then there will be promoters and there will be um, agents and various other people, and, and presumably they're not. So perhaps the shape of the network is, is if, where people are in the network is affected by their role. And, but then that also made me think about questions of power and, and access, because the, again, the nameless people seem to be in a fairly sort of you know, subordinate relationship to the artist, but the artist will also sometimes be in a subordinate relationship to a gallery owner or something like that. And, and so I, I wondered if there was a, a kind of a dyna power dynamic involved in where people end up and how their relations are mediated. Hi, uh, thanks for that. Uh, I found it very interesting. Um, I'm Elisa Bellotti from Manchester as well. Um, mine is a bit of a technical question. I was wondering if you have considered about using uh, some tools to download these online networks. So now we have like Name, Jenner and Jane apps, so you can download on the Facebook network. We've got Twitter um, applications. So in a sense, it would be interesting to use these like more standardized tools so you can actually download these have hundred whatever mm -hmm. faceless people and then maybe compare or use them for the artists to talk about that because in that way you can also spot if there are different roles as Nick was saying but it would also probably be useful to go to you to use them to map the field. So because you're looking at social relations of establishment, so how these people have, what kind of people do they have in their networks? Do they use Twitter more for work and Facebook more for their private life? Uh, who follow their blogger, uh, their blogs, and uh, what kind of you know, roles they, they cover? Are they all only fans or are they gallerists or people like that? And also, I think it would be interesting then to compare them across and a long time so you might have you know, a student who is building up the network to find that establishment and more established artists where the network is, I don't know, more large or more dense or more various in terms of roles. Okay, so you've got, I think, three very big questions. Um, I think there's one there. You'd imagine people would be getting tired towards the end of the morning, but no, we just take those three as efficiency lunches. Yeah, I'll try to answer these questions briefly because I'm here between me and lunch. So. Yeah, I, I think I'll start with Elisa's question, and I think uh, definitely it's very relevant. And I've actually tried downloading my own network and kind of when I did with the name Jack Web that we I think have established at Oxford, uh, I used that one to look, have a look at my own Facebook. Um, um, at the, at the social ties that I have in my own Facebook account and to see how this could be relevant and I think you're completely right. But the reason is why I didn't want to start with this. I wanted to do, let's say, the open hand drawings first because I didn't want, I have the impression that when you confront people with these diagrams and with these visualizations, they get completely constrained by the visualization. That's why I wanted to do the hand drawings first. But it's actually something that I'm planning to do to kind of compare how their own narrations of um, how they are connected, um, how they would visualize their online connections to these people. How does it, um, 
resonate with actually a visual representation that you can download, as you said, from uh, Facebook and to kind of... But I'm not quite sure how I should like focus on the roles because I'm not really sure, um, well, first of all, ethically, if I'm actually allowed to do this, because this is something that we've been discussing quite a bit, to do research and to think about you know, to talk about specific ties who I think might be, I don't know, an important player or maybe like a broker person. But, um, so this is one thing. On the other hand, I was also wondering how do I, how do I approach this? Do I let the person kind of interpret their visualization or do I start to pick out specific relations that I think are relevant and then ask them about their interpretation of these specific relations. So there are still some things I need to figure out before I do that. Because I think it's quite, but my impression so far has been that it's quite a big impact if it's not with a visualization that people think that they are really, really constrained by that and then you say, okay, this is the reality. And I actually wanted to give them a more, a better tool to kind of define first what they think because it's still a visualization even if it's you know, based on real data. So yeah, um, but yeah, it's a very good comment, and I think I'll, I will, I'll try to include it further down in my research. Um, okay, um, let's move on to Nick's question. So is there a power dynamic emerging? Um, so far, I have. Um, well, what I can say, I've talked to. This is also why I tried to talk to a, a variety of artists. So I talked to people who are still at art school. I've talked to people who are kind of so so successful, or who I, where I had the feeling that it's actually quite difficult to judge. Like, how do I judge who is successful? But I had, in terms of like commercial success, was quite clear that these um, gatekeepers, like galleries and all this, are still very very important. And I've just had an interview on Friday with a very very um, kind of emerging upcoming artists and he's kind of like uh, talked about the media as a new star um, of the art scene and I talked to him and he said well social media that's all kind of you know irrelevant what you need to do you need to know important people you need to know um, other artists that are recognized and he said you need this recognition from the artistic field you need um, the recognition of gallery owners you need to be in touch with um, with um, art collectors, you need to be in touch, and you also, I mean, what is quite important, I think, as well, all those that I've talked to so far, they all have uh, an art degree, so I think it's quite important still to have this kind of verification, so when it says, you need to account, like, art degree from, I don't know, Royal Academy of Arts, I think this has quite a big impact, but to kind of determine who, uh, who might be the, like, kind of important, like, this kind of important people in the network, I think, yeah, I think I might be able to do that, but then, yeah, I need to think about it. <laughs> yeah, um, okay, um, I'll try to get to the last question, which was from Ingrid, um, um, it seemed that they were getting more important, like you say, for people throughout. And this is actually something, I mean, you're completely right, and I'm specifically interested in what, what all my ties mean, like, this is why kind of why my reach search shifted like to this side. But I think it's also uh, kind of like a drawback of this method because you focus more on like the overall holistic picture and you lose quite a bit of detail with the actual, let's say, offline strong ties. And I think what I found myself is talking less about these people, which could be quite important actually. And I think this is something that I, well, I mean, then I think, should I do both? And then um, do the hand drawn networks like um, at the end? Because this is quite, I mean, I'm aware that I'm losing quite a bit of detail with the traditional ties. But, um, well, I had to start from somewhere, so <laughs> I might follow up with this. Okay, well, thank you yeah. very much for being here. Thank you.